Live from San Diego, California, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to KubeCon Cloud Native Con here in San Diego. I'm Stu Min and my co-host is Justin Warren. And one of the things we always love to do is really dig into some of the customer use cases. And joining us to do that, Andre Ribka, who's the head of compute architecture in the CTO office at Bloomberg. Andre, Correct. thanks so much yeah, for joining thank you. us. Thank All you. right, so to, just to set the stage, last year uh, we, we had your, your colleague Stephen Bauer uh, came uh, talked about, uh, you know, your, your company's been using uh, Kubernetes for a number of years. Right. Uh, you're a member of the CNCF as one of those right. end users there, and you're even an award winner. So, yes. congratulations on all, all the process. You've been Thank doing you. it for years, so all the problems, I'm sure, are already solved. Um, so, so now we just have a big party, right? Yes, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, certainly we are at the stage where things are quite mature, and there's a lot of workloads that are running in Kubernetes. We run Kubernetes on-premises. Uh, Steven has uh, an excellent uh, data science platform uh, that does machine learning with GPUs and bare metal. Uh, we also have a really excellent team that uh, runs uh, uh, basically uh, platform as a service, generic platform as a service. Uh, not G GPUs, but uh, effectively runs any kind of stateless app or service. And um, that's been extremely successful, and uh, you know there's a lot of uh, interest in that. And we also run Kubernetes on public cloud, mm -hmm. so a lot of uh, workloads for like Bloomberg.com actually are backed now uh, by Kubernetes. Yeah, so we want to yeah. spend a bunch of time talking about the applications, sure. the data, the services. Uh, you, you've built some passes there, but yeah, step us back for a second, if you would, and. You know, give us the what led to Kubernetes, and sure. as you said, you, you've got your on-premises environment, you've got public cloud. Sure. Where was that when you started, and right. what's the role of Kubernetes in that today? Sure, we started uh, back in 2015, uh, evaluating all kinds of sort of uh, container orchestration platforms. It's very clear that developers loved containers for its portability and uh, you know just ability to have the same environment that runs kind of on-premises and uh, or on, on your laptop and then it runs on the uh, actual deployment environment, the same thing, right? So uh, we looked at uh, Mesos, Marathon, Cloud Foundry, um, even OpenShift before it was Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in the Office of CTO, we continuously sort of evaluate all different options and then uh, once we make a decision, we recommend to the engineering team and work in partnership with engineers. So all of those awards and everything, actually I want to say that this is really a kudos to our engineering team. You know, we just a small part of the puzzle. Um, now, uh, as far as like how we made the Kubernetes selection, it was a bit risky. Uh, we, we started with uh, pre-alpha version and uh, you know, I've read the Borg paper, uh, you know, how Google actually did Borg and when I sort of realized, well, they're trying to do the same thing with Kubernetes. It was a very clear, this is kind of, you know, we're going to build on mature experience, right? So uh, somewhat it was, it was risky, but it also a safe bet because, you know, there was some good computer science and engineering behind the product. So uh, we started uh, alpha version. Uh, the uh, consumer web groups actually were one of the first deployments of the kind of the Kubernetes. Um, and uh, they presented in the first KubeCon. Uh, it was an excellent talk on how we did Kubernetes. And uh, you know, we came a long way since then. We've got sort of uh, now probably about uh, 8,200 clusters uh, running. Wow. And um, you know, they run full high availability, DR minus uh, one. I would say it's one of the most reliable environments that we have. You know, we have. Uh, Frequently, you know, infrastructure outages, hypervisors, uh, you know, the obviously hardware fails, which is normal, and uh, we rarely see any issues, and actually, you know, no like any major issues whatsoever. So, uh, you know, the the things that we expected out of Kubernetes, things like reliability, elastic infrastructure, auto scaling, uh, you know, the multi-tenancy, it all worked out. You know, higher density of sort of packing the nodes. Uh, you know, that's another great sort of value add that you know, we, we expected, but now we're finally realizing that. So one question I've had from a lot of customers, particularly traditional enterprises who are used to doing things, and they have a lot of uh, virtual machine infrastructure. Right. Um, they're looking at Kubernetes, but they're finding it somewhat opaque, a little bit scary. 
Talk us through, how, how did you convince the business that this was the choice that we should make and that we need to change the way that we're, we're developing applications sure. and deploying applications and we want to do this with Kubernetes? How did you convince them that this was going to be, it was going to be okay in the end? Yes, yes, uh, yes, that, that's a really good question. Uh, a lot of people were scared and you know, they were, you know, is this going to break things or you know, is this just a shiny new thing? And mm -hmm. There was a lot of education that had to occur. Um, we've shown a lot of POCs. Now, the way we exposed Kubernetes was not just like a raw Kubernetes. Uh, we actually wanted to keep it safe. So uh, we sort of stayed away from some uh, like more alpha type of uh, workloads and moved towards kind of like the most stable things. And so we exposed this platform as a service. So the developers uh, did not actually get to necessarily like kubectl, you know, uh, apply a config and just deploy the app. Like we actually had a really good um, sort of offering where we had uh, kind of almost like a Git flow kind of environment where you have, you know, uh, your uh, you know source control, then you have CI CD pipeline, and then once it goes through all the checks and balances, you deploy your containers. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, uh, we, we actually hit quite a bit of things that made things a bit dangerous or potentially a little more complicated. And that proven to be the right strategy because, uh, you know, right now, as far as like the reliability, I would say this is probably one of the most reliable environments that we have. Um, and uh, this is by design, you know, we uh, basically tell the developers by default, you, you're supposed to run at least two replicas. Uh, at least two data centers by default, or two you know regions or two availability zones, and you can't change that. You know, there's some people who are asking me like, can I just deploy just in one data center? I'm not sorry, no. Like that by default is like that, and out of scaling on. So if one uh, you know data center goes and you you need the R minus one, so if you started with two minimum replicas, then it auto scales to four or whatever that would be set. So. You know, I think we basically put a pr prototype, a proof of concept, relatively fast, and we got uh, with the initial uh, platform as a service, uh, you know, from zero to actual delivery in about three months. Right. A lot of building blocks were there, and we just put it, kind of the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. All right. Uh, that does that does echo a lot of the, uh, the discussion that was had in the keynote today even, was about looking at uh, making Kubernetes easier to consume, right. essentially by having all of these sensible defaults, like you mentioned. Yes. You will have two replicas, it yes. will run in these two different yes. zones. And kind of removing some of that responsibility for those decisions from the developers. Yes. Um, how does that line up with the, the idea of DevOps, which seems to be partly about making the developers a bit more responsible for their service and how it runs in production? But it sounds like you've actually taken a lot of that effort away from them by, by right. we've done all of this work for you so you don't have to think about that anymore. I mean, a little bit of background. We have about uh, 5,500 engineers. Uh, so expecting everybody to learn DevOps and uh, Kubernetes uh, is not realistic, right? Yeah. Uh, and most developers really want to write applications and services that add business value, right? Uh, nobody wants to really manage networking at the low level, you know, and uh, you know, it, there's a lot of still complexity in this environment, right? So, uh, you know, as far as DevOps, we build shared kind of teams that have, uh, you know, basically like a, think of like centralized SRE teams that build the core platform components. Uh, we have uh, world-class kind of software infrastructure group which builds those type of components. Yep. Um, on top of the sort of the you know, technology infrastructure team that uh, caters to the hardware and the virtualization infrastructure built on OpenStack. Uh, so you know, the, the, there's very much kind of a lot of common services slash shared services teams that built that as a platform to developers, and that's how we can scale, uh, because you know it, it's very hard to do that if every team is just sort of duplicating uh, each one of those things. All right. Yeah. So, uh, Andre, let's talk a little bit about your application portfolio. Sure. Uh, Bloomberg must have thousands of applications yes. out yes. there. From what you were describing, is this only for kind of net new uh, applications? If you know, if I want to use it, I have to build something new, replacing uh, something else, or yeah. can, can you walk us through kind sure. of what percentage is? on this platform today, and sure. how's that migration and it's or It's not transition? necessarily not net new. Yeah. We actually did uh, port quite a bit of the sort of classic Bloomberg services that developers expect to the platform, and it's seamless to the developer. So we've been doing uh, quite a bit of sort of Linux migration, meaning from like uh, things like Solaris, AIX, and this platform was built purposefully to help developers to migrate their services. 
Now, they're not sort of lift and shift type of migrations. You can't just expect the, you know, classic C++ shared memory app suddenly like jump, you know, and uh, start being in containers, right? Um, so there, there are some architectural changes, differences that had to be done. Uh, the type of applications that we see, uh, you know, they're just sort of microservices oriented. You know, Bloomberg has been around since 1981 and they've been doing service oriented architecture since like early 90s. So, you know, things were already kind of in uh, services kind of uh, framework kind of mentality and, and, you know, before, you know, we had service meshes, Bloomberg had its own kind of paradigm of service meshes. So all we're doing is kind of retrofitting uh, the same concepts uh, with the new frameworks and uh, what we did is we brought in sort of like a new mentality of open source first. So most new systems that we built, we look for kind of what about if, you know, we look for open source components that can fit in the, you know, this particular problem set. So the applications that we have right now, we have quite a bit of data services, uh, uh, data transformation pipelines, machine learning, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of the machine learning uh, as far as like the actual uh, learning part of training, and then there is the inference part that uh, runs quite a bit. Uh, we have quite a few of, uh, you know, content services, like I mentioned, Bloomberg.com, and uh, many sort of uh, things that you would normally think of, like the content delivery services that run on Kubernetes. Um, and I mean, at this point, we certainly try to be a little bit conscious about stateful services, so we don't run you know, as much of databases and things like that. Uh, eventually we'll get there uh, once we uh, prove the reliability and resiliency around the stateful sets and Kubernetes. Yeah, I, do you have an estimate internal or goals as to what percentage of applications are on this platform now and a roadmap going forward? I or? mean, it's hard to say, but going forward, I see majority of our services migrate into Kubernetes because for us, Kubernetes is becoming essentially a standardized compute fabric. You know, one thing that we've been missing, you know, there's a lot of open source projects uh, delivered, you know, virtualized infrastructure. But, you know, that's not quite enough, right? You, you need other sort of concepts to be there. And um, Kubernetes did deliver that for us. And more importantly, it also delivered us um, kind of almost like a multi-cloud strategy, uh, you know, kind of uh, accidentally, because, you know, the, not, none of the cloud providers have any standard APIs of any source, right? Like, so even if you use Terraform, that's not necessarily multi-cloud. It's just like, you got to write HCL for each cloud provider. Uh, in Kubernetes, more or less, that becomes kind of a really solved problem. Well, I, I, so, which, what, what flavor of Kubernetes are you using? Do you leverage any of the uh, right. services from the public clouds on Kubernetes, or yeah, what's that relationship? Yeah, I mean, excellent question. So, uh, you know, we want to leverage managed offering as much as possible, because things like patching the security, uh, you know, CVEs and things like this, uh, I want somebody to take care of that for me, uh, and, you know, harden things and out of the box. So, um, the sort of the, the key to our multi-cloud strategy is use uh, managed offering, but based on open source software. So if you want to, you know, deploy services, deploy them on Kubernetes as much as possible. If you want to use databases, use managed database, but based on the open source software like Postgres or MySQL, and uh, that makes it portable, right? To, to an extent. I mean, there's going to be some slight differences, but. I do believe that managed is better than if I'm going to go and bootstrap VMs and manage my own control plane and you know the uh, workers and things like that. Yeah, and it, it is a lot of additional work that I think organizations generally did try to roll their own and, and do everything themselves. Yes. There's a lot more understanding since the advent of cloud essentially yeah. that actually making someone else do this for, for what is essentially the undifferentiated heavy right. lifting if you can get someone else to do that for you, it's, it's a much better experience. Yes. Which is actually what you've built with the Kubernetes service for your developers. Correct, is yes. You are becoming that managed service yes. for your app developers. I think a few uh, enterprise organizations have tried to do that a little bit with centralized right. IT. They haven't quite got that service mentality there where I'm the product owner and I need to create something which my developers find exactly. is valuable to use so that they want to use it. This is exactly spot on. Um, when I joined Bloomberg uh, six years ago, one of the things we wanted to do is effectively offer a public cloud like services on premises, and now we are there. We yeah. actually have a lot of managed offerings, uh, whether you want you know, Kafka as a service, 
queuing as a service, uh, or you know, uh, cache as a service, or even Kubernetes, but not necessarily we want to expose Kubernetes as a service, we want to expose platform as a service. So uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head because effectively uh, developers want kind of the same uh, things that they see in the public cloud. Oh, I want, you know, I want fact function as a service, I want Lambda, something like this. Well, that's the type of platform as a service, right? So you, you're spot on. Okay. Yeah. So Andre, last question I have sure. for you. Uh, you, know, you talked about the maturity of the managed offerings there. Uh, something we've seen a lot this year is the companies that, how am I going to manage across you know, various environments there. We right. saw, you know, uh, yes. Microsoft with Azure Arc, yes. you know, VMware with yes. Anzu. Yes. What do you think of that? Is, is that something that interests you or anything right. else in the ecosystem that you still think needs to mature to help your business? Sure, sure. I mean, um, I think the, the use cases they're trying to address are definitely near and dear to my heart uh, because we are trying to be multi-cloud. and. Uh, you know, in order to, to be truly mature multi-cloud uh, sort of uh, company, we need to have a sort of mature kind of multi-cloud control plane that has uh, kind of the deployment address, CICD pipeline address, then it needs to address the security, uh, not just like day one, but day two, alerting, monitoring, all of, like, you know, if, if I was just to have three different you know, win, uh, portals to look at, it's very complicated. You're going to miss things. I, I want one pane of glass, right? So what these companies are addressing is extremely important and I, I, I see a lot of value in it. Now from my point of view and uh, in general, what we prefer, if it was an open source project that we could contribute and we could collaborate on, we, we'll still want to pay money for the support and whatnot. We don't want to just be, you know, Free, free riders, right? Yeah. But uh, if it's an open source product and uh, we can be part of it, it's not just read-only open source, uh, that is definitely something that I would be you know, very much interested in participating. And majority of the developers that we have, they're very happy to participate in open source. I think you've seen some of our contributors here. Uh, we, we have some people contributing to Kubeflow. Uh, there's many other uh, projects. Uh, we have quite a bit of cool projects like the Chaos Engineering with a powerful seal. Uh, if somebody wants to check it out, we've, we've got some really interesting things. All right, well, Andre, really uh, appreciate you sharing uh, what, what you and your engineering teams are doing, and uh, yeah, thank you thank for you. all the contributions back to the community. Yep. For Justin Warren, I'm Stu Miniman, back with more of our three-day wall-to-wall coverage here, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. Thank you for watching theCUBE.